So hi all, welcome everybody. Uh, it's uh, today's ECR presentation by Dr. Fang Ming Zi. My name is T V Singh. Uh, many of you might know. Uh, I'm Chief Computational Scientist uh, at uh, Office of Advanced Research Computing. And so the topic of today's presentation is the high throughput survey of brain cell diversity and organization using dimensionally reduced spatial transcriptomics. Uh, uh, sorry about uh, the pronunciation. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. G. Uh, he is a postdoc in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at UCLA. Prior to joining UCLA, Feng Ming received a, his BS degree in physics at the University of Science and Technology of China. He visited UCLA as an undergraduate student for a summer working with Dr. Robjin Brusima and Dr. William Klug. Uh, <clears throat> many of you might remember Dr. William Klug. Uh, uh, he then pursued a PhD at UCSD where his research focused on integrative analysis of single cell transcriptome mice and eigen, uh, eigenomes of uh, brain cells. So Feng Ming loves neuroscience, genomics, and physics. He believes many parts of these disciplines can be brought together to sharpen our tools and advance our understanding of the brain. So without much uh, ado, I invite Dr. Zi. So Zi, all yours. Um, thank you, TV, for the kind words, and uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, can you guys hear, uh, hear me well and see my screen well? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, so today I'm going to uh, present this ongoing work uh, in, with my lab mates in Woman Lab, where we try to develop uh, a technology to high, uh, with a high-throughput survey uh, of brain cell type diversity and organization. Um, please feel free to interrupt me at any time asking me questions. You can unmute yourself or anything. It's better uh, be interruptive than wait it until the end uh, because by the time you probably already, it's likely that you already lost interest in this talk or gone somewhere for lunch. So be interruptive and ask me anything. So um, we are interested in understanding the brain. I think to this audience, uh, many of you, uh, uh, the concept of uh, artificial neural network is natural to you guys. And um, I guess what's more natural is we each of us is equipped with a biological neural network. That's our own brain. So what, what's the similarity and differences between them? So um, artificial neural network is a mathematical construct implemented in a computer um, where each circle here represents a node or a neuron that does very simple mathematical operation like linear summation and thresholding. But when they aggregate in massive number and talk to each other, they together achieve a complex task. Um, so our brain works fundamentally in a similar way where each neuron or node um, is a cell, uh, which by itself is a complex molecular machine. And they talk to each other. Early on, people realize when they look into our own brain, uh, they send out those branches and attach to each other, talk to, talking to each other. Um, and they, when they combine together, they, uh, they achieve a complex uh, 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 computation. Um, um, but what, what's also different, one striking difference between these two is uh, we know that artificial uh, neural network, the nodes we don't pre, uh, are, are, not, are not different uh, priori before we train it for different tasks. Uh, we initialize them with random connections. Um, and then uh, based on the task we see and our experience, uh, each node uh, specializes. But we were born with a brain with a very complex organization and cell type diversity that each 
cells already is committed to something specialized uh, before we learn anything, experience anything in this world. So uh, how do we understand our own brain? Um, we, be we begin by understanding the cell type diversity and how they organized in the brain. And uh, from early on, as, as this picture shown, uh, uh, we realize uh, each brain cell uh, uh, is morphologically very different. They have different shapes and sizes. And later on, people realize uh, not only cells have different morphology, they also have different physiology, meaning they respond differently to stimuli and they are located in different parts of the brain and they talk to uh, different subsets of other neurons. And because each cell is a complex molecular machine, they express different molecular signatures, like different genes. So, um, and uh, among all these diversities, um, uh, molecular diversity underlies all of them because these cells is established by a molecular program um, and uh, their function is, is because of their molecular uh, uh, machine. And um, we ask this question, how we can comprehensively survey this molecular diversity of cells in the brain at the scale, at the whole brain. Um, so um, the past decades has uh, seen an explosion of uh, technology development that uh, gave biologists a lot of tools to look at uh, brain cell type diversity. And so this plot on the left shows uh, the leading technology in surveying the uh, molecular profile of the brain cells, uh, which is uh, the single cell RNA-seq. And, and so this diagram compares the speed of ad advance um, measured in how many cells you can you can profile in a single experiment. Compare that with uh, the progress of uh, uh, the uh, Moore's law, which captures how many tra uh, uh, transistors uh, you can do on a chip on a computer chip. And in both cases, uh, the throughput goes up uh, uh, exponentially, and uh, the single cell RNA seq actually goes. Uh, increases uh, increases at a faster rate than Moore's law, um, but uh, uh, and on the right it's a different technology called spatial transcriptomics, uh, which also goes up exponentially. And uh, with a decade ago, we can barely profile about uh, one hundred cells, but now up to date we can at most uh, profile up to one million cells in a single experiment. So. Such achievement is amazing, but compare with the uh, difficult uh, 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 biological uh, biological complexity. For example, in the mouse brain alone, and uh, there is one hundred billion cells, and, and the human brain is almost a thousand times larger than the mouse brain. And for to conduct uh, any biological studies, you need to have multiple brains control versus cases. So that times n, and if you want to study development and aging, you need multiple sample multiple time points and to compare with disease, different disease states and, and so on. So yeah, so uh, at, at, as of now, so one experiment can sample 1% of the mouse brain and to survey the full mouse brain, it, it usually requires years of work for a large team um, before you can answer those uh, uh, larger scale questions. So um, uh, there's a clear demand for higher throughput technology that allows us to sample uh, uh, the molecular uh, diversity at a higher efficiency than we currently can. So um, in order to understand the limitation, I think I'll, I'll digress a little bit to introduce a little bit details of how these technologies, the current technologies work. So uh, here is one cells and our, we aim to capture their um, 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 messenger RNA or mRNAs, those are molecules that float around in, in the cell. And how do we capture it? One way is to uh, use sequencing. So we break it apart and capture their mRNA molecules and we send it 
into a sequencing machine, which is, by itself is a complex contrast. Um, but uh, that allows us to target, to know uh, the sequence of every individual mRNA molecules we, we captured. And by this method, we can capture all types of mRNAs or, from all genes, but we do not capture the spatial information um, because we have to dissociate cells and, uh, and, and take them apart from the tissue. Um, another method is by staining and imaging, or what we call fish. Um, so what we do is we have the cell, we clear it, uh, so make it optically uh, transparent, and we design probes, which themselves are mRNA, uh, DNA molecules complementary to the um, mRNA we wanted to target. And with those, uh, with those probes carry a fluorophore that can uh, send out a light once you excite them. So we use those probes to bind specifically to the mRNA molecules uh, in tissues. And uh, then um, we can read it off from the fluorophores they send out. With this method, uh, we can capture theoretically you know, with this primitive construct, one type of mRNA molecule at a time, but they preserve the spatial information. So these two, uh, method, the sequencing and the fish, um, uh, represent two archetypes of the technology people use to target the molecular profiles of the cell. Um, but over time, especially the last uh, decade, people have come up with a lot of different technologies that try to com uh, com combine the best of both worlds. So here are, are some representative. So, but um, uh, as you develop these technologies, some general uh, trade-off uh, emerges. So there's uh, this trade-off between uh, multiplexing versus resolution, multiplexing, it means how many genes you can capture with sequencing on the end captures all the different genes you express and fish uh, on the other end capture one at a time. Um, and for resolution, um, a fish has perfect resolution. It can capture every single molecule inside your cell, whereas a sequencing um, do not have uh, as high spatial resolution. But later on, uh, Murfish and SlideSeq, for example, tried to uh, bridge this gap uh, by cap uh, ca with SlideSeq capture some spatial resolution, not at single cell level yet, but close uh, with Murfish that can capture over a hundred different uh, molecular species uh, simultaneously in one tissues. Um, uh, with still with a molecular resolution. But as this technology gets more complex, and we still suffer from this problem of throughput, where uh, because uh, you measure so many genes at a time at molecular uh, resolution, the throughput tends to be low. Um, so uh, we, we wonder what's missing in our current uh, portfolio of technologies. Uh, um, so um, what we really want is something that have just enough multiplexing or number of genes or information channel we capture to resolve cell types and just enough resolution to resolve the location of each cell, not necessarily the location of each individual mRNA molecules, um, but hopefully uh, as as much as a, a, a high throughput for, for the whole mouse brain or more. Um, so uh, we offer our solution, which we call it uh, dreadfish, the dimensionality reduced fish. Um, so the key difference between our methods with existing fish-based uh, technology is we try to measure aggregated signals of many genes at a time, instead of trying to resolve the signal of individual genes. And uh, we aim to image the samples at cellular resolution instead of molecular resolution, which is much finer than cellular resolution. And hopefully uh, by these two combination, it frees us up to uh, be able to scale up these operation uh, almost 100 fold compared with the leading uh, spatial transcriptomic technology or MRFISH. So 
uh, what's what's this idea? Um, so uh, my my lab mate uh, Zach uh, originally came up with this idea. We uh, we we initially uh, we begin by thinking about what's the current status of molecular profiling of brain samples. So we first take out a brain sample. This is a picture of a mouse brain, and we measure their genes in dissociated cell. For example, in single cell RNA seq, which capture all genes of there are over 10,000 genes expressed in each, uh, each cell in the brain. And, um, and this, uh, this means each gene is, uh, um, is represented in a high dimensional gene expression space. To figure out their cell type, uh, we need to bring it down Op uh, operationally using um, uh, a computational uh, method uh, to reduce their dimensions, such as a principal component analysis uh, to about tens of uh, dimensions, in this case, 24. And based on the similarity and differences uh, between cells in, in those low dimensional embeddings or low dimensional molecular features, we resolve their cell types. So why do we do that? For one thing is because um, many of those genes, uh, uh, of those 10,000 genes, for example, are not expressed, and many of, of them are expressed uh, constantly uh, at a consistent level across all cells uh, we, we captured. And that we only want to capture the variation among the, those cells. And also many genes act together, uh, reg uh, they regulate it, they are co-expressed either up or down simultaneously in the same cells. So there's uh, information uh, from the information perspective, a lot of redundancies in those original high dimensional uh, feature space. Um, so if that's the case, uh, we wonder whether we can experimentally directly measure those low dimensional space. Um, and um, so instead of measuring 10,000 of genes uh, in the same cells, we've, we, we can directly measure their tens or so low dimensional bases. And hopefully they still capture rich information about the molecular signature of a cell from which we can resolve uh, cell types. So um, the key idea is to be able to implement this computational projection or dimensionality reduction using chemically in situ in directly on the biological sample by mapping those gene by basis matrix uh, to a probe set. Uh, we call it a bivalent probe set, which one with two arms, where one arm maps to the gene and the other arm maps to the basis we are going to measure. And um, what comes with this is the benefits of aggregated signal. So if they, you, because each dimension is a combination of the signal from many genes, uh, we intrinsically get brighter signals and less dropout. Um, and uh, by aggregation, it provides a more stable or less noisy summary of the of the measurement. And also gene intrinsically acts get together in modules. We hopefully directly capture those modules of gene expression and that are present in cells. Um, so um, so how does this work? So in detail, so here, here's one example of it. Here I'm showing you two cells, uh, each of them expressing three different genes. So cell one expresses two copies of gene one, uh, one copies of gene two, and one copy of gene three. And those information can be summarized by a cell by gene matrix. So if we multiply that matrix by a vector, we reduce its dimensionality from three, the three genes, to one dimension, the one basis we try to capture. Um, so if we assign, in this case, uh, three weights to, to gene one, one weight to gene two, and no weight to gene three, we can actually implement this uh, with a probe set where we designed a set of probe that binds to three different locations on gene one, one location on gene two, and no probe bind to gene three. And we read them out using the same readout probes. So by this binding 
and with the endogenous mRNA molecules by the probes, we can then collect the signals uh, of the probe to, to achieve this uh, low dimensional projection. And this is just one projection. We can de design different projection matrix uh, vectors. For, for example, in this case, no ways assigned to gene one, but two and two assigned to two and three. Now we can read off a different signal, a different low dimensional structure. Uh, from the cells. So by either this computational uh, operation or by this direct measurement, we can hopefully capture uh, this low dimensional uh, gene expression space uh, for individual cells. Uh, the key is to uh, design the projection matrix and implement it by a bi bivalent probe set. Um, so the large part of this talk will be talking about how do we design a projection matrix that capture as much as information as possible uh, on uh, the brain cell types. So I'll talk about in general three different methods. Uh, first of all, PCA, and then PNMF and neural network. Um, so PCA or principal components analysis is the classical um, dimensionality reduction method. So uh, in this case, we have a matrix X of P genes by N cells, where P is about 10,000 genes, N is about 1 million cells or so. And we want to reduce this dimensionality of X by applying a matrix projection matrix W to it so that the whole dimension uh, reduces down to 10 to 100 components. Um, so what PCA does, uh, one way of look at it is it tries to minimize uh, the difference between the original data in the high dimensional space versus the uh, low dimensional data where you project the original data down to a low dimension and reconstruct it back to the high dimension, although it's not uh, uh, although some dimensionality is removed. Um, so we designed this matrix, PCA designed this matrix W that tried to capture this, um, uh, uh, the, the information in the original matrix as much as possible. And um, there's a nice theory proof that PCA represents the best rank K matrix for linear reconstruction. In other words, if you want to reduce dimension into K, PCA gives you the best K dimensional reduction uh, uh, for uh, if you just consider linear re reduction. Um, so what and, and PCA also has this feature of negative weights, which means um, gene can contribute uh, positively or negatively to a basis, um, but that is going to give us a hard time experimentally to implement this because, as if you remember our bivalent probe design, we can readily assign all positive weights, but not positive and negative weights at the same time. Um, PCA also is non-sparse. Uh, that means every gene contributes a little bit to every basis. Uh, but for our, for our experimental purpose, we want every basis to capture a small number of important genes in that instead of all genes uh, by a small amount. So that makes PCA almost unusable for our purpose. So we turn to a different algorithm, uh, we, which we call DPNMF. Uh, the key part is NMF, it's non-negative matrix factorization. So we want to design our W, the projection matrix, a bit differently than PCA. It, um, if you, th there's two terms. So the first term still tries to reconstruct gene expression in the original high dimensional space. However, we require the projection matrix to be strictly non-negative. So by non-negativity alone, it induces also other desired pro properties for experiments, including sparse. So um, e each basis is now represented only by a small subset of all possible genes. And also uh, different bases are mutually exclusive. Uh, so each basis capture a different set of genes. So uh, this plot on the right shows the difference between PCA-based uh, projection versus DPNMF-based projection. You can see uh, uh, DPNMF is all positive and they capture different subsets 
of genes in each one. And, and the second term I didn't go into is we try to promote the differences between uh, cell type centroid as much as possible in the low dimension we choose to project. Um, so even before I come to this lab, uh, we have applied this idea uh, on a, a mouse brain data from the cortex and hippocampus. And uh, from that, uh, we come up with a projection uh, with 24 bases. Each bases capture a different number of genes as shown in this matrix. And together, they capture almost 6,000 unique genes. And uh, each uh, gene was assigned a different weight from 1 to almost 100 uh, differently. And we have implemented it by applying it to measure uh, actual uh, uh, brain slice. Uh, this is one coronal section of the mouse brain. Uh, basically what I'm showing you here is the raw, uh, uh, the process data with one mouse brain uh, section, but measured by tw these 24 different bases. Um, so uh, each, each dot here is one cell and their color represent the intensity of the signal uh, from that basis. And you can see that different bases capture different information, anatomical uh, structure of, of the mouse brain. And we compared, uh, 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 so we can use those 24 numbers to, to classify those uh, individual cells into known cell types and compare them with the uh, signal to be expected from other technology like single cell RNA-seq. And by comparing between uh, the existing methods with our method, you can see that uh, many of the cell types are consistent with each other. And if we go into uh, the um, anatomy part, we can uh, hierarchically um, uh, plot the distribution of cell types we captured, and they agree with the known uh, mouse anatomy, uh, including where the cortex are, cortex are organized in layers, and the hip hippocampus are separated by three rough parts with uh, molec uh, distinct uh, molecular signatures or cell types. So we are encouraged by this results. And uh, uh, we ask what can we do uh, to, to go from there. Um, so uh, one thing is to re experimentally reproduce this results by applying it to the whole mouse brain. That's what my experimental colleague is working on. On the other hand, from the uh, computational front, uh, I was wondering uh, how good exactly is this DPMF based projection in an absolute term? And is there any other better designs than this existing one? So to evaluate how good the, uh, the low dimensional uh, projection we come up with is, we, we, we evaluated uh, how much variance ex is explained by this low dimensional embedding uh, uh, compared with uh, PCA, for example. And um, so here this plot shows uh, as the number of components or low dimensional embedding increases, um, uh, how much variance uh, do we capture? So PCA uh, sets the upper bound because by a linear kind of uh, a linear construction and um, using 24 uh, low dimensional uh, uh, embedding, you can cap capture more than 80% of the variance uh, that's present in the original high dimensional data. And uh, what we came up with the PNMF because of the experimental trade off, uh, go below that, but not too much. Uh, it still capture about 70% with 24 bases. So uh, I think, uh, so we, we are encouraged by that. But what we can also do is um, uh, and on the uh, simulated, uh, on the uh, data where we have the information of uh, all genes, project them down to the 24 bases we designed and look how each known cell types in the brain is represented by those 24 different uh, bases we designed for, for. So in the this matrix, uh, these matrices shows you uh, just that, where each row represent one known brain cell type, 
um, and each column is one uh, low dimensional basis we designed try, uh, that try to capture those different cell types. And for specifically for the brain, we know there are three major cell types. Uh, the in, or non-neuro uh, non-neuronal cells on the one end, and uh, for neuronal cells there are uh, two broad groups: excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons. And within each group, there are subtle differences among them. And you can see that this algorithm, in general, does a good job in capturing those general relationship. Although for our purpose, what's undesirable is we care a lot more about the subtle differences among neurons than those big differences between different non-neuronal cells, uh, because we know priori that there are a lot of different diversity among neurons that we, we uh, that's interesting and we wanted to capture. Um, so it looks like by just applying this method, uh, we can we can capture uh, it, it tries to put more weight on bigger differences between cells than on the subtleties between uh, different uh, excitatory neuron subtypes, for example. So we wonder if we can do something about it and, and come up with a different design that assign more weights or more resources to the subtle differences among neurons. Um, so one way of doing it is trying to tune this strength of the second term, which I didn't mention, which tried to promote the differences between cell type centroids as much as possible uh, um, and um, de-emphasize the uh, reconstruction of transcriptum part. Um, so uh, once we, we, we uh, to our surprise, as we tune up the strength of the second term. So mu controls the strength of the second term. We systematically tuned mu from zero uh, uh, up until 100, until it broke. Um, but what we found was uh, the projection we learned is quite stable among those unknown cell types. And that's uh, to our surprise, um, uh, we don't quite understand that. Why do we, when we try to emphasize the differences among cell type, we still come up with basically something similar. So by look deeper into that, we come up with this new tweak of the original DPNMF, which we call tree DPNMF. So the basic formula is still the same. Um, although I didn't mention previously this predefined S matrix, which define, um, which measures the separation among cell types. Originally, it was engineered such that you, you measure the cell type centroid versus the global centroid. So so if each point graphically is represented, uh, each, each cell type is represented by one dot, you compare it with the global average of uh, profile. Uh, so that's the original plan. So, um, but we know that cell types are intrinsically hierarchical organized uh, uh, like this, where you you have major cell types and each major cell types is subdivided into more subtle differences. So we can tweak it such that the S matrix measure the hierarchical distance among cell types, where each cell type centroid is measured against their parent and their parents against their parent, so on and so forth. And hopefully by capturing differences this way, we can capture more subtle differences among the sub subtypes than those uh, broad differences. Um, so we applied, we tried this DP in the math trick and um, again, tuning up the strengths of uh, cell type separation by this mu with this one parameter. And indeed what we found is as mu increases, more resources is uh, uh, it's going towards capturing the sub subtle differences among inhibitory and excitatory neurons and less and less uh, uh, about their uh, glial subtypes. So, um, and here's some quantifications. Um, so, um, uh, if we just focus uh, on one of this matrix, it measures, so each row or column it represents one known cell types, and it measures their correlations across uh, 
for all pairwise correlation uh, among cell types across those 24 bases we designed. And you can see as you go, as the mu goes up from the left to the right, and uh, the original similarities among those known cell types or subtypes begin to break. Um, so and that comes obviously at a cost of reconstruction, which I didn't talk about. Um, so uh, lastly, so that's the part of our uh, linear, uh, linear reconstruction and how we can design uh, projections to achieve, uh, to capture uh, the cell types. And uh, the last thing we also tried is we wonder if we can design a neural network uh, based design and, um, to, to do the same thing. And the intrinsic advantage of neural network is it goes beyond the linear reconstruction. And it's also end to end, meaning that we could first train a neural network that take as input the uh, high dimensional transcriptomic signature of each individual cell and, and going it through a, a bottleneck of low dimensional embeddings and then use those low dimensional embedding to directly train a decoding network that, uh, uh, that uh, predict the cell type of that cell. So um, you, you can propagate the error of cell type projection back to the embedding and back to the encoding so that we hopefully we can uh, achieve a more efficient design uh, than we previously can. And um, it, another advantage of a neural network is we can add very flexibly, very different constraint uh, to incorporate necessary experimental constraint, uh, which I'll explain in a few minutes. And there's also uh, the learning framework uh, uh, of a neural network is scalable to large data set because uh, we, we train by stochastic gradient design, which uses many batches of data, which is invariant to the uh, uh, data set we are considering. So we tried a very simple neural network design, which include one linear, so what we did yeah, from the 10 dimensional, uh, high, uh, sorry, 10,000 dimensional gene expression space down to 24 bases. And from 24 bases, we try to predict um, uh, the cell types of each cell. And you have, in this case, in the data set we are testing, we have 44 different subtypes from the brain. And um, um, so, and here, uh, here I'm showing you the performance uh, in terms of uh, cell type uh, prediction accuracy for individual cells uh, as, an, as the number of bases or low dimensional embedding increases. So with three low dimensional bases, we can measure, we can predict cell type um, uh, labels uh, at 70% accuracy. And as it increased to six, it goes to more than 90% and for 12 and for 24, you can, it plateaus at about 95% accuracy overall. And uh, on the right is a breakdown of for each individual known cell type, what the prediction accuracy are. So obviously for a larger cell type, because it has seen more data, it tend to perform better, but with 24, Basis, uh, um, many of the known cell types can be accurately predicted. So, um, and then uh, once the neural network is trained, we can compare how the encoding by neural network is different uh, uh, from the original linear uh, uh, matrix factorization based design. So, on the left is a typical matrix. Uh, 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 factorization based design and on the right is a is one trained by neural network so one striking difference is so uh, what's presented on the um, on the left of each uh, each sub uh, matrix matrices i guess is the unnormalized signal intensity. And on the right is the no, uh, intensity after normalization within each uh, basis. So 
one thing neural network produces, it tries to learn some more balanced basis. In, in other words, in different rounds of imaging, different rounds of embedding, the signal intensity is uh, more or less equivalent versus uh, uh, the uh, uh, NMF-based design uh, uh, tend to have some uh, uh, bases with high intensity and some other bases with low intensity. So we don't have to do much normalization to capture uh, this low dimensional difference among cell types. Another thing is um, uh, the matrix factorization based one tend to highlight uh, of one cell type or similar cell type uh, uh, individually with different bases, whereas the neural network based one tend to be a bit more combinatorial in their uh, design to capture cell types. So that's one difference. Um, the other uh, advantage of that is uh, we can incorporate experimental constraint uh, while we are designing those. So one constraint about uh, using our method is each gene has a certain length. That means you can only design a limited number of probes uh, targeting each gene. In other words, each gene cannot be assigned more than a certain number of weights by this projection matrix. So originally, there's no way of incorporating such constraint in the linear uh, factorization method. So what we did is we first come up with uh, a design regardless of the constraint, and then we manually uh, capped the constraint. And, uh, and, and that obviously destroy, uh, destroys some signal of the original design. Um, but by this neural network framework, we incorporate this constraint uh, 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 at the, uh, into, the, into the design so that once um, the neural network learns, it simultaneously learns to predict cell types and to meet uh, uh, this gene, uh, 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 gene, uh, probe constraint. So this plot on the right just shows, so how many, for each gene, how many uh, probes it is allowed to have versus how many probes did the neural network uses. And you can see none, almost none of the genes was assigned more weights than it can. So, and we can do so much about these kind of things, including, uh, uh, so it, when training neural network, we can in, introduce dropout. And by this dropout, uh, we, we can uh, naturally simulate the experimental noise happening in the binding uh, of our probe to the endogenous RNAs. And we can try to learn, uh, as we tune up the dropout rate, we can try to learn a design that's robust against actual dropout happening in the experiment. Um, so here are some plots showing as you increase uh, the dropout rate, you can still achieve a very stable classification accuracy. But uh, with different dropout rate, they come up with a different projection. Um, so, uh, and also another thing to do is we can add sparsity constraints. So to tighten up the basis even more. So uh, without sparsity constraint, each basis learn a subset of genes, but you see this long tail uh, events where many genes were assigned by only one weight, um, but with a regular uh, uh, with a sparsity regularization, we, you can try to reduce those genes that are assigned a very small amount of weight and try to learn a more compact uh, projection. And and in either case, we can meet this accuracy. Uh, uh, we can reach an accuracy of more than 95%. Um, so I guess one last thing I'll talk about, is we are still implement, uh, uh, playing around with this. We can, um, we can engineer the expect signal intensity between different cell types and finally control how much intensity they have. This is just one example by playing around with the constraint in the neural network. We can assign half of the low dimensional embedding to be brighter and the other half to be dimmer. Although this is not ideal in, in the experiment, but we can 
tune different, um, we can engineer different patterns essentially um, for cell types in uh, how they behave in the low dimensional space. For example, in this case, uh, we try to assign for each uh, low dimensional basis, half of the cells to be brighter and half of the cells to be dimmer. So now you can see half of the, half of the bases highlight half of the cell types and the other half uh, highlight the other half. Um, then we can do a lot more subtle uh, engineering on these to come up with different patterns in the low dimensional embeddings. And uh, the goal is to hopefully come up with a design that's robust to experimental noise uh, when, as you measure those differences among cell types. Um, but this is still ongoing. We can come up with a lot of different patterns but what we are still unsure is uh, what exactly do we want to go with and uh, what, uh, which one is best to be implemented by experiments. So uh, with that, uh, uh, let me conclude uh, this uh, talk by com uh, coming back to this original plot where Ro uh, Ramon Cajal uh, saw on, uh, under his microscope over a century ago, neurons having different sizes and shapes. And what we are trying to do is essentially to color Cajal's original drawing. By color, we mean it, we assign molecular specificity to each of those neurons. And um, there are, all, uh, of course, a lot of other methods that can also con uh, achieve molecular specificity. But what's unique about our method is hopefully we can generate a scalable version of it. By scalable, we mean we color each, just uh, have just enough resolution to co uh, cover uh, each cell by their color, but not too much into their individual molecules yet. So uh, with that, I would like to thank um, my lab mates, uh, everyone in the woman lab, especially those I named uh, who contributed significantly to the to this project, and also my collaborators and uh, IDRI fellowship for uh, especially for giving me this opportunity to talk. So I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Z. <laughs> So there is a question in the uh, chat box. Okay. Um, uh, how does this change based on the concentration of G1, G2, and G3 transcripts? Oh, how does it change uh, based on G1, G2, and G G3 on the concentration of G G1, G2, G3 concentrate? Oh, I see. Uh, so let me come back to the slide where. This is relevant. Um, Dr. Singh. Yes. Uh, this is Suraj. Suraj Bhatt <clears throat> and Dr. Pangming. Uh, uh, um, if, if you allow me to interject here, uh, sure. the, uh, that was sure, the question sure. I asked. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you to get, get going on this extraordinarily complex problem wherein you are simply trying to relate numbers, just mere numbers, to spatial uh, position and the phenotype. Uh, it, it's it's a daunting task, and somebody has to do it, and somebody is bold enough like you to ask those questions. So uh, it's it, it's phenomenal. Uh, 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 the whole rendition that 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 you talk about the PCA and 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 the single cell analysis for a, a, a biologist like me, uh, who 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 is constantly very aware of the phenotypes that we are talking about. Uh, Dimensionality reduction is is sounds fabulous, but it's based on high variability between cells. So what you do, the main principle PCA, the main component that you have is the one which is highly variable. And then what I get get confused about the whole situation, you are finally trying to get to see the differences, what you call subtle differences between cell types. Here you are reducing variability and looking for subtlety. Isn't there a conflict somewhere here? Uh, what, what's going on here? There is a, there, either there is a linguistic conflict or there is a mathematical conflict here 
that you are trying to measure subtle differences by reducing dimensionality and which is based on tremendous and the, num, the, the high variability so 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 you know um, uh, uh, you see the conflict that i have um, and i and therefore that was the origin of the question when you said g1 g2 g3 uh you i would also like to comment on how did you how do you make those bivalent probes those constructions are based on previously published data which is single cell data or sequencing data. So when you say that you get the same thing what you saw in the single cell data, yes, I would expect that would happen because that was the basis initially for you to have made those bivalent probes, right? So yeah, I don't yeah, know whether yeah. that is the real test on those. Yeah, great. Yeah, but thanks you know, for the question. I'm yeah. going to stop here. <laughs> I can I want to tell you to I want you to 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 address the the conflict that 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 I raised. No, no, thank you very much for, for these excellent questions. Uh, let me answer you the second question uh, first. I think that part I understand better. Um, so you're asking, so we really need single cell RNA-seq in the first place to design a matrix that, that's informative to, to do these kind of experiments. Absolutely, Absolutely you're, you're right. We, we indeed need single cell RNA-seq experiment a priori to inform us uh, how to how to get uh, a low dimensional uh, basics that capture the cell types and um, um, but what's the added advantage of this once you have one single cell RNA seq as a reference you do not re need to repeatedly measure those ten thousands of different genes every time Absolutely. and if you can do this in a high throughput way you you get uh, the extra extra benefit of capturing the spatial organization of the tissues which is really powerful so that's the second part the first part um i think so you um it is a confusing concept and uh, you wonder what's the why why can we do dimensionality reduction in the first place and how can it capture the subtleties among cell types um i guess um uh, first of all, uh, why can we do a dimensionality reduction? Um, so um, that's because uh, genes are co-regulated or co-expressed. Um, they go up and down together. Many genes go up and down together in the same cell types. Um, so in other words, if you, if you have a matrix where each gene is randomly uh, expressed in a combinatorial way in different cell types, you, there's no way you can reduce dimensionality at all. Uh, the reason we can reduce their dimensionality because not all possible combinations of gene expression patterns is realized in, in brain cells or yeah, they, yeah, so neurons share some, some sim similarities and different subsets uh, share some similarities. That's how we can reduce dimensionality. By this way, uh, to capture subtle differences, yeah, uh, there's a. Um, so, um, yeah, I I don't know if I understand this is uh, specifically your, where your confusion. You even is. I don't understand what I'm yeah. talking about, but 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 yeah. there is there is a yeah. conflict there. But uh, uh, we noticed, I guess, in this talk when we play with the data, uh, there's this trade-off between reconstruction reconstructing. Uh, uh, the whole transcriptome versus uh, rec uh, capturing the subtle differences among cell types. Yes, yeah, those are, I think, I think yeah. you indicated that you have a conflict there. And I think yeah. that's possibly because you only take the positive values in your factorization. You don't take negative values, which would indicate you up and down genes. So you simply remove them. You simply don't come, you don't think about them. So that may be the reason that the global, uh, global uh, reconstruction fails. Uh, it's it's possible. I I have hmm. no idea about uh, as I told you what I'm talking about, but 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 I just see the conflicts, and um, I think I think it's uh, I I I I wish yeah. uh, Dr. Singh we have more of these talks. <laughs> it is this is just fabulous. This is tremendous to have. Yeah, we can definitely talk more. Uh, what what I feel like it, uh, the issue is less about the positive or negative values because mm -hmm. you can always uh, break apart the positive part and the negative part in the same PC into, into two different mm -hmm. majors. Then you can sure. you can uh, re replicate the same thing. Uh, but uh, what seems to be likely is uh, cell types that are similar 
a shared similar transcriptome. When you measure overall the error in reconstructing transcriptome, they naturally go together. You will identify uh, the major differences among cell types. Yes, but you're, the, you're, you're, you're basing it on the predominant transcripts. In yeah, cell, yeah, right? exactly. Not, so you're if, not basing on the smaller ones. Right, right, right. Exactly. Less than but if, if you want to capture the subtleties, yes. you really need to design it to, to, to direct Absolutely. it. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I think Iran has a comment. Iran is actually my PhD advisor. Hi there. Yes. Nice to see you, Feng Ming, and, and beautiful talk. It's, it's exciting to see what you've been doing. Uh, I'm curious. I, I think it's related to uh, Siraj's question. So um, in your reconstruction area, are you, are you trying to reconstruct the counts or is it the log counts? And I ask because, as you know, you know, there's, there's, you know, uh, expression of different genes varies over orders of magnitude. And so I, I can imagine that that makes a big difference. Um, and how do you deal with that, right? If you yeah, have... uh, we ex uh, we try to reconstruct counts instead of log counts, um, or or CPM to be accurate, uh, normalized counts. Um, yeah, one thing uh, which uh, I think uh, one limitation of this method, I think you notice exactly, is uh, we wanted to capture log counts, but there's no way we can implement a log transformation on this uh, binding event. So we we are stuck with this linear operation right uh, from the beginning. Uh, so computationally, it's easy to first take log, then do everything, but uh, experimentally, you you just you can't take log transformation. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, Great. Thank you. Any other question? <clears throat> um, is, is there a cost reduction coming coming with this proposed designs? Cost reduction. You mean uh, how many probes do you need to order in order to do this experiment? Is that the, is that what you mean or? Yeah, how many probes or is, is it cheaper than to, to do, doing the say single cell RNA, RNA seq? No, no, but uh, not not with single cell RNA seq though. For single cell RNA seq, uh, you, you do sequencing, so the cost there has nothing to do with designing probes at all. But I guess yeah, for Murfish, there's a direct comparison. So. Um, Indeed, it's it's costly to order these probes because, as you see, each gene was assigned different weights, and each weight requires a different probe that bind to different subsections of, of that unique genes. So, for the current implementation, uh, one probe set contains an, a ninety thousand different probes. That's a lot, uh, and it's quite pricey. No, but uh, and it has to be fine tuned uh, uh, to different system. Uh, but once the probe set is there, you can amplify it and reuse it. That's okay. Thank you. Mm. Oh, hi, hi, Fami. It's a really great presentation. I know a lot about the spatial part. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. I have a question about the so basically you are trying to find a dimension reduction that can try to find the subtle difference in those micro specific cell population. So I was wondering why don't you just, uh, for example, uh, once you do the, the, the dimension reduction for the, for the whole, whole population of cells, uh, then you just exclude those uh, distinct uh, cell types and then focus just on this uh, small, uh, small population, I think it's, uh, it's Excitatory neuron or something, and then use that data to do another round of damage reduction. So why don't you do this uh, if you care the subtle difference? Um, if I understand you correctly, you are saying you want to do this in a hierarchical way where you first separate the major cell types and train right. a different design on a different subpopulation of cells. Is that right? Right. More like an adaptive way for figuring out the uh, the difference. Yeah. I think that'll work, and we tried that. If we just train on um, each subpopulation, we, we, we can see beautiful differences among those sub subtypes. And then you're dealing with uh, um, the problem of combining those. Uh, um, so, um, yeah, actually, um, 
yeah, actually, you can do that. Say, if you break apart the 24 bases and devote explicitly eight bases to excitatory, eight bases to inhibitory, eight bases for glia, you can do it for, for each of these eight, and it's it's achievable, um, and it works. Um, and yeah, uh, but it um, why didn't we use it? Um, um, yeah, I forgot the reason. So then you need to worry a little bit about uh, uh, the compatibility among different bases. Um, mm, yeah, I, I, I forgot the exact reason why, but we have tried that. It, it does work. Mm, That's it. Thank but, you. Yeah, but I I I think uh, the argument there was it doesn't really increase the efficiency of the of of how how little yeah the goal is to use as as few as possible low dimensional in information to capture as much as uh, possible cell type diversity and I think um, uh, my conclusion back then if you do it hierarchically it doesn't really you you still need to make a lot of decision decisions at each branch. Um, but we can talk more about that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Well, it's uh, too past the time. So, uh, if you have any other question, you can always reach out to uh, Feng Ming. Um, he's at UCLA. So, <laughs> uh, I'm sure collaboration of any kind will be uh, welcome. So uh, thank you uh, all for joining us and um, thank you to Dr. Uh, Feng Ming. So hope uh, we do have these uh, talks uh, every month, uh, almost every month. So hope you will be joining us again. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you thank TV. You. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs>